exclusively on the Business Outlaws Network. Every artist should bend over backwards to do business with you. They really should because you actually give them equity and no one gives equity. Explain that. Well, the difference is I want to play in a different arena because if you're if you go in the major label ecosystem, then you are subject to the rules of that. Right. Right. But we all know because once again, going back to the intellectual property and the ownership IP, principle yeah. and the IP and owning the IP. Now everything you do, every piece of content you put out, every time. So it's like, oh, you want to do an Instagram story? Cool. Do an Instagram story, but then do three or four on your own mm -hmm. thing. So yeah, do one, draw them in, and mm -hmm. then get them to you. You know what I mean? Right. And then you're monetizing, you're getting all the customer data. So you're changing the ecosystem. <laughs> Welcome, Outlaws, to the big show. We have an exciting afternoon for you today. <laughs> so, Che, this is the only show where we have a bud tender and a bartender. And we were going to wait till the show started, but we've already got you we couldn't <laughs> smoking wait. and drinking tequila. Yes. Well, he's going to be one of our favorite guests because he's partaking in both. He yes, didn't pick he a side. He's, That's right. He's very friendly to both sides. So today we are chatting with an icon and visionary who has had a way bigger impact on our favorite music and pop culture than you probably realize. He's worked with musical legends such as Kanye, Beyonce, Aretha Franklin, Hans Zimmer, Dr. Dre, Eminem, Santana, ASAP Rocky, among many others. So welcome to the safe house. Thank you thank, for coming. Th yeah, thanks for welcome, having me. Trey. Thanks for having me. I love this place. Can, yeah, I, can, I, can I move in? Yeah. <laughs> sure. Tequila and weed in the afternoon sounds like a great day. Yeah, we, we know how to sets, do it. It sets the afternoon up just right. Makes for good conversation, it though. It does, yeah. So you, ju you just left good music and you're on an another chapter? Yes, it's, it, was, um, it was a great experience, you know, just spending time. You know, I've, and that's I've, Kanye's I've, label, right? That's Kanye's yeah. label. Um, I was with him for about six and a half years. Um, it was just a really great experience of, you know, traveling the world and creating art and meeting people. And it was a great journey, you know. It's, it's all, don't get me wrong, it was a roller, yeah. roller coaster, but it was, yeah. it was exciting. How, how much of the label is a system like it seems like the quality and the amount of music that's produced is insane like there has to be some sort of system that's producing all that content at that high of a level well yeah um you know the under universal there's there's several sub labels like interscope is one of them and they have over 200 artists on the roster so you know they have you know it's content is king these days so they have to generate they have to keep coming out because streaming you know, brought money back into the music game and, and cause it's all digital media now. Right. So, was, so now the labels are like, Oh, you know, so they know the game is, we got to get those releases out. We got to get those, you know, get that music out. So whether you're, so it's volume. Yeah. So the game has changed. Let's talk about the old style game versus the new game, because you have a formula and you have a system that allows artists to, uh, sharing the profits and i'll let you explain all that i thought, think it's fascinating what was the old school way versus the new school way because there's a lot of young folks out there listening to this and, and they would like to know how it really works how does the music business how did it work really in the past and how does it work now well if you think about the music business in the past is a way good think about it is like you went and got a mortgage for a house okay but then you never own the house so even if you pay back the mortgage you never own the house wow that's that's the that's that's what a record deal is, right? That, our, that sounds like a shitty deal. It sounds like a shitty deal. Yeah, yeah. But, but you know, most artists were re relatively penniless or broke. So the fact that someone came along. Wait, wait, hang like, on for a second. So you said they're penniless and broke. So the, the, so the, the producers know this. So how does that play into the negotiation? It must be, it must put them at a disadvantage. Well, it does because, you know, an artist is, wants to achieve their dream, right? right? So when someone comes along and says, hey, I've got 400,000 for you to make an album. We'll put 100,000 in mm -hmm. your pocket. You're just like, oh, that sounds good. Sure. Right? It's $100,000 that I didn't have and I can go make an album. But then when you break down the deal, then that, then it's when it's like starts oh. being a little bit more. So rather than, so what, what you get as an artist is you get a royalty deal, 
Okay. So you get a royalty percentage of the success. What is that? What is that percentage usually? It's somewhere between. They call it points, which okay, is points. the same thing as yeah. percentage, right? So it's probably anywhere between a normal. A real shitty deal would be 12 points. Mm -hmm. Probably average is more like 15, more like superstars, like 20, right? Okay. So um, like Michael Jackson would add 20. 20, 22, or something like that. Okay. Um, but you, you, you've, hear, you've heard this term thrown around where people talk about owning their masters and like yeah. know, Jay-Z's gotten to the point where he owns his masters and so forth. It is, it is relatively unheard of to own your masters. So you've Why? Achieved, Why is it unheard of to own your masters? Because that is the asset. That is, that is that the is, valuable that is the thing. Value. That's the asset. Yeah. So if you're building a record company and you want this, you know, you, you build, you simultaneously, if you're a smart record company, you've also launched a publishing company. Right. So you ought not only, you know, have your master ownership, mm -hmm. but then you also have catalog, right? And that's how you build. So when you sell a record label later for a hundred million dollars or whatever. Right. So that master and catalog can be used though to go to New York and get loans, correct? Yes. And, and you put up, you put up your, your, your catalog. Yeah. As collateral. Exactly. So if you remember Michael Jackson, one of his biggest assets right. that he owned for a while, or I don't know what, where it is now, yeah. the, but Beatles? the Beatles catalog. Yeah. Yeah. So a lot of the loans and monies that Michael used throughout his life was borrowed against the Beatles catalog. Wow. Yeah. So there's these amazing assets that can be generated from an album, right? And, and all these income streams that come off of it. So now, in the, in the previous years, 360 deals didn't really exist. A 360 deal is simply uh, where a record company participates in in far more um, revenue streams from the artist. So, the, so whatever the revenue, merchandise or, or a brand that the, maybe a tequila brand, yep. they have their fingers in the pot. They have their fingers in the pot. It's like more like a fist, though. Isn't touring it? Pub yeah. to publishing, yes, yeah, everything. And and ancillaries basically means any other monies that, oh, you, wow. that you bring in, we get a piece of. Yeah. Now. TV show Pro, or whatever. Yeah. Now, 360 deals made sense, obviously, when you have a smaller, when record companies, the you know, dwindling market, you know, they're not making that much money. But then along comes streaming. And now so let's talk. How did streaming change the game? I mean, people say it changed the it game. It was the enemy for a while. It was the enemy for a while. Like, what the hell? Can you break yeah. that down so people well, can understand what, I mean, every, what's everyone, going on right now? Everyone has theories, right? So, meaning the record business to me is so unintelligent and i'll tell you why okay um you can't fight technology it came along you know everyone said when cassette tapes came along oh the music business is over it's going to ruin the business same thing happened when cds came right. along so this thing comes along called napster oh, rather yeah. than embrace it and figure it out and realize this is the future and we got to break we got to embrace yeah. it we got to figure it out they don't so then steve jobs looks at them and says oh you idiots hmm. okay well i'm gonna make itunes and now I'm gonna, and I'm also gonna destroy, even though I've made this new thing that everyone's like, oh, this is cool, we yep. can download, and we got iPods and bring it, cause he really wanted to sell you iPods. Mm -hmm. He didn't really care about iTunes. He really wanted to sell you mm -hmm. iPods and right. then eventually telephones. But now you could buy a song off an album versus before you had to buy, buy the, the whole album. album. Yes, you had yeah. to buy the whole album. And right then he broke down, he literally broke this, the whole framework mm -hmm. of the music industry right there. You know what I mean? And they let him come in and do that because they didn't embrace Napster. If they had embraced Napster uh, and figured it out, they could have they could have sort of defended against that, you know, in the first place. Mm -hmm. But that's that's the music industry, right? They're always, you know, they're still trying to sit there and make the money right. and, and not evolve. Yeah. So uh, Daniel Elk, who's the founder of Spotify, who, who I'm friends with, um, he told me when he created um, Spotify, he was simply trying to take some of the money that was being lost in piracy. Mm -hmm. And just monetize it for artists. That was that was almost that was that, that was, that was, plan. That was his plan. Yeah. And now it's you know I don't know what Spotify is worth thirty billion or right, the huge. evaluation. Yeah. yeah, whatever it's doing. Um, and it's obviously streaming is taken off. But the the thing about streaming is is you know if you own the intellectual property as as you know, mm -hmm. um, every time it's played anywhere anytime mm -hmm. it ge it generates. Now not only does it generate money, it generates you know, consumer behavior, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All it's like two. It's just, it's just, it's it's valuable, sure, right? Because now, what is what does Google do? Uh, or Google with uh, YouTube, and they they sell it to brands, right? Right. But the difference when you play in some. So one thing the record labels do, which is really interesting, and I call this the Netflix model, hmm. and this has to happen to the music business too. But for instance, and this is why I use my drug dealer analogy, sure. Um, if I'm the biggest cartel, 
right? And there's all these existing corners. Mm -hmm. You know, I want to sell my product on all the corners. Yep. But, you know, what do I really want? I really want my own corners. Sure. You know what I mean? So when you're a record company, when you put your stuff on, you know, YouTube, mm -hmm. Spotify, any or any platform, Pandora or whatever, right? You're putting it on their corner. Yeah, you are. Their yeah. platform. Yeah, you're making money because they have a distribution. That's a great analogy. <laughs> yeah. But they but they share what data what data they want to share with you. Yes, they do. Yeah. So right. some may give you, you know, okay, this is how many times your thing has been played with, mm -hmm. you know, played and so on and so forth. But hey, I want to know who played it, what time they played it. You know what I mean? Do they listen to it at now, night? Wait, that's, so that's interesting. You're actually getting down into the granular level about who your audience member is. Yeah, because that's valuable, right? Yeah, because, it's very valuable. Because then now, no, now because I now I can I know where I want to tour. I know where I want to sell merch. I know who I want to sell merch. I know who my audience is. I also know who's not my audience and what work I need to do. So now when I market a project, I can be really specific about how I market it versus just throwing it at a wall. Right? Correct. Because right now that's what record companies do, even with all this data that exists, because old school and new school don't mix well. Really? Yeah. So some companies are more technology um, savvy yep. than others, and, and they, they've worked together, obviously. But you can think of, I like to think of a, a record label, a major record label, as, as a cruise ship. Oh. So you know how long it takes to turn a cruise ship. That's right. You know what I mean? And, and now we're in the industry where you need a speedboat. Ah. Uh -huh. You know? And I'm that, and now you, I'm you building need that cigarette boat. Exactly. And that's now, right. and now I'm building a speedboat. There you go. So that. So, okay. That's the old model. Now you've got a totally new model that kind of just takes the whole industry and flips it right up upside down on its head. Just tell yeah. us about that. Well, um, well, f well, first let me tell you, uh, there's a guy named Terry McBride. He's kind of like a Russell Simmons type guy. He's a music mm -hmm. guy turned yoga guru. Okay. And probably in about 2008, he wrote an article that was in Wired magazine where he prophesied the future of the music business. Mm -hmm. And and, be, and because of the inclusion of technology, he prophesied a music business where artists owned and where they partnered with the resource. Yeah, yeah I remember that. I read that. Yeah, and there's that word that, you know, the record companies don't ever want to say. So no, they, want it, they don't want to hear you say own, meaning that means you're talking, well, you're, own. You're talking equity. That, right? Chance is an amazing example of that. Chance has never paid a distribution fee. So I'll give you an example of what a major label deal looks like even 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 to a like a big label like what happens is you let's say i'm in a deal with def jam okay so i would have say a 50 50 with def jam okay. right which means i get 50 percent of the profit def jam is owned by universal which is also owned by universal corporate which is owned by you which is owned by the, <laughs> Ooh, a lot with, of with, fingers with, in that with, pie which is owned by vivende jesus okay so there's a number of layers there <laughs> it's like so, five layers so, so that 50 50 is really an 80 20 yeah right now on top of that, you pay an 18 to 20% distribution fee. So now you're even further reduced. Wow. All right. And then, <coughs> so when we get to bottom, all the way bottom down to the artist, yep. there's no there's no space for the artist to own it. Just that a few points left for this guy. Yeah, yeah there's, no, there's no real participation. And then they're charging everything against those royalties, right? So if you shoot a video, if you go yeah. on tour, yeah, you, you got to pay it out of your 12% or oh, your 17%. Oh, oh yeah, you got to repay that loan. That, that's yeah. what the producer doesn't. He's you know. putting the money up. He's loaning you the money. He wants his money back, right? It's the mob. Yeah. yeah. It's the mob. So the majority, the majority of the music artists that you see out in the, in the world have never received any money from their record deal beyond an advance. Which Only is, publishing usually yeah. they get, right? Well, publishing, and then they get their touring money. You know, they so make how the hell money. they actually make their money? I know it's touring, but like, like in the break streets, it down. they got to, they got, they have to tour. They got it, they got it, they got it. So they're on the hamster wheel, yeah, whether they, they like they, it or not. They yeah. got to keep, they got to hold and up. You're at products. home, and yeah. you got third, 20, 30 people out on the road doing their, doing the grind, doing what they love to do. Yeah. And, and then, you know, it's some, the it's producer some, makes the majority of the money. There's the nothing label, wrong with not the, the producer. The, no, the, label, the, label, the label does. The yeah, label does. Yep. Okay. The label does. The label um, does. And the labels will argue that, you know, because of there was a dying market, right? Okay. The labels will argue that we had to be more aggressive with it to just okay. to balance the scales. But now the money's come back because of the streaming, right? Okay. So now that, and that's where you heard Taylor Swift making a big stank about it. Right. About yeah, well, yeah. And so, but now... Even this big money that's being shared and all this money's being made, yeah. it still goes to the top three percent of artists. So the top three percent are so strong that they can right. Beyonce can come say, and they can you, "Yeah, you got sure. you know that you know that forty million that Spotify just paid you, Sony. Yeah. I need a taste of that." You know? And what would what would a normal taste be? What would like what would they get? Was, well, let's say it was a hundred million dollar deal. Well, you have to think, easy. Spotify. Every time they yeah. use play anybody's song, they yeah. have have licensed it. 
Sure. Right. So they and and this is where the major labels play the game, right? Okay. They would say Warner would say Spotify, I need twenty million for you to license our stuff. Okay. And then Sony would say, Well, I need twenty five. And the Warner would go, Well, wait, 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 wait. If Sony's getting twenty five, then we want thirty. And then Universal would come at the end and say, well, okay, if they're getting 30, then we want 40. So they would play that game, and that's what yeah. Spotify – but that's when Spotify didn't have power. Right. Now, because Spotify's distribution is so strong, they can – there's a little now, bit – there's, there's a little bit of pushback. Everyone's getting real with each yeah, other. Yeah, because, you know, obviously these deals and the way these licensing deals work, they don't want Spotify to become a Netflix, right? Because mm. all it's the same thing, right? Spotify was Netflix. Yep. You know, because Netflix distributed – you know everybody else's shit mm -hmm. and then now all of a sudden they have their own street corner. now that now they're the biggest film studio mm -hmm. they're the biggest television studio wow they have the most spend on original content yeah right so that's a scary thought to so all the record labels, spotify could become a label yeah if you know if the can if, spotify become a label well, right now do you those, think they those, will well, the licensing deals make it are preventing that, right? It's okay. like almost like non competes in the licensing right. deal. So there's ways around certain things, but you know, but I do think the scales change over time. So let's talk about the, the scales changing because how do you do it? Because the way that you do it is absolutely fascinating and probably the fairest game going for an artist. Could you explain that? Well, honestly, social media has changed things right okay in the past you needed a record label you needed if you're an artist you need to market yourself you needed the money mm -hmm. behind you you needed a record label the need of a record label has changed when an artist may already come even before they're ever signed before they ever deal maybe they got popular on soundcloud or youtube or whatever the mm -hmm. case is they already have a million followers on social media okay. so now you as an artist have a direct one-to-one -one relationship with a million of your fans yes and you know and now, if you do like Chance the Rapper and you have a little bit of investment and capital behind you, now I, I don't I don't need to go. Chance the Rapper has never paid that 18% distribution fee that I've talked about, never paid for distribution once. Okay, He's had money invested, right? And that money they've turned around and used it to market. They've used it to market videos. They use it to you know promote Tour. tours and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. And now Chance the Rapper, even when, you know, just to get an exclusive at like say Apple Music, Apple Music probably gave him five or 10 million just for that, just to, for him to drop wow. it through Apple Music first because he's built okay, himself. Okay, for how out. long do they have to drop it first? For 30 days? I don't uh, know what, what the, the deal was, but some different. sort of, yeah. yeah, one sort of window. Um, I don't believe in exclusives and I'll tell you why, because okay. I believe that the music should be available to everybody everywhere. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I don't want, I don't care if you use Apple Music or Spotify, whatever you use, I want my song there. So were you, you know? against the, when you did it with Tidal and Kanye? Yeah, and then, you know, it's business strategies. Um, and certain things, what, what go behind the scenes are we use some of that funding to do other things. So I'll give you an example. So one of the things we, we launched a Pusha T album and we wanted to do this movie. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what the movie was, a hundred grand, but let's say we went to Universal. Mm -hmm. They were like, oh yeah, we'll give you 20. So now I got about 85 grand or something to come up with. So made a deal with Title. And you know, then Title comes in and that, in that case, it makes sense because we're getting done what we wanted to do, which is a piece of art that we wanted to create. It's marketing, but it's also a piece of art and it's something that he wanted to do. It's something we didn't have to do. Well, Title got the best part of that, right? Yeah, so they get the good look of that. And and so there's times to do deals like that. But I definitely feel like exclusives don't necessarily help an artist. How does it work when, so Chance works on Kanye's album, and then Kanye's on Chance's album, but he doesn't have a label. Do they call you and try to clear? Oh, they have to. They still and have so to clear. what they is your position when you're running a label? I know like you want to be a good guy, but the fact is you got to be, you got to have, there have to be you're playing inside of these rules and he's yeah. not oh lucian's always gonna make so pay. you, do you get pay. a strong pimp hand with that or what what do you do no because yeah i mean you know kanye's star, a big enough artist that if he wants to do something they're gonna green light it you know what i mean so if he says i want to be on chances record they green light it now that means kanye may waive his fee but that doesn't necessarily mean universal will waive their fee so universal you still may have to pay universal wow. for the use of kanye on the chance project so chance has to pay for that yeah so and 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 then chance can what was and, your thought process during that that you know chances on the outside and you're on the inside no no that's no, fine i mean you know i i mean if, if anything envy you know i just think i think what chance has done is amazing and i think more and more artists he's clearing a path should study that and and they don't and, and it's funny to me that knowing the success of what chance has done and showing people 
that people, more people don't do it. It's still the allure of that big advance. Now I will say this though. Wait, the, wait, wait. What's how big of an advance do they give somebody? Like, well, I now like, if you if you've if you've blown yourself on social media because yeah. it's a popularity contest, right? Okay. And you make yourself in demand. There's some outrageous deals. And, really? Yeah. And what's what I mean by that? One yeah, exactly. Like, what's the most oh, I just heard something recently that was maybe 3.6 million. They gave up some profit share in a deal really? and so on and so forth. And the artist, would, what it was is all the new artist did is he just drove up the demand, had every label bidding on it, kept driving it up. There's some really good lawyers that specialize in this mm. and, and that. They're experts at getting everybody yeah. all excited. Yeah. But huh? that still isn't as good as Chance's deal. Well, because you have to get there. You have to have faith. You know, and, you have to be Chance because yeah. Chance is super talented. Well, he, yeah, and he built that. You know what I mean? Like, it doesn't start off like that, right? That's, right. Just, that's any anybody could be that. Um, but- well, do you think at every step he thinks about getting a label? Uh, I doubt it. I think no? he's. I think he's established and he's going to stay where he's at. Keep he's in that he's lane doing. now. Yeah, I think he's great. Like he's already in the driver's seat. Now for another artist, it might be hard though because if if you want to go that route and then you have this other label waving, you know, a big ass check at you, and you know you're a kid from you know you know even even whether you're from a middle class family or sure. a lower class income family. It's like someone, changing. Yeah, if someone's waving a million dollars at you, you're going to be like, shit. Sure. You know? So you know, Mike, why you think that producers make a lot of money is yeah. because the producers will get four points on an album, right? Uh, but the, know, points, yep. the points don't go to pay back the tour, the recording of the album, the music video. The artist has to pay all that back. Right. So the artist might have 17 points, but they're paying back millions of dollars oh, with that. their 17 points. The producer gets paid from play one. Okay, yeah. so Max, Martin, Matt, uh, Matt, was it uh, Mo- well, well, they really Lang? Those yeah, they, guys are making a fortune because they, oh, yeah, they, own a pe- they, they get four or five percent off right, the top every exactly. time there's nothing and, right. There's and nothing they, they owe. Yeah. yeah. And keep in mind and, they, and they they're not wrote, on the road. Yeah, keep in mind they wrote the songs. Correct. So the the biggest income they get is publishing. Yeah. You well know? like Mutt Lang. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and those guys, you know, a, a hit record is 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 a massive you know, like if you're if you get a top five billboard record, that's a ma- that's a massive income, you know, that's a life changer. It's, I, you're really, instantly a millionaire. I know? sat next to Brian Adams on a flight back from New York, and I was like, okay, what am I going to say to Brian Adams? And I go, best producer of all time, Mutt Lang or Rick Rubin. And he talked for 45 <laughs> minutes and didn't stop. He's telling me how Mutt would wake him up at 2 in the morning yeah. with um, no, more tequila. No, lighter. <laughs> Sorry, oh, thank you. Oh, bong, <laughs> tequila. Anyway. There you go. Um, but yeah, Mutt would write all those songs. So Mutt was getting the publishing for songwriting. Right. I'm, um, a lot of producers get get that too, right? Because they're writing and yeah, producing. a lot of producers write. But even like if you think of the Beatles, um, you know, obviously George, I mean, um, John and Paul wrote the majority of the songs. George Martin was the producer, but you know who made the money was you know John and Michael Paul. Jackson. Yeah, and even yeah, right. <laughs> and even um, one of the reasons George Harrison started writing more was it was like, oh shit. I can they're write. I want to make. I want. Yeah, I want to make. I want to make some of this money. You know, I'm tired of carpooling with yeah. John. Exactly. So. What is the life cycle of an artist? So they come in, they're nobody. What does that look like? They see that first money, they get all excited, they grab it, they sign their name. At what point do they realize, actually, I didn't get such a good deal? What is that that kind of that <laughs> shift in their brain <laughs> that happening and then you have to deal with it? Yeah. Well, one of the things, the other, there's another thing to consider is that social media, the barriers of entry are easier, right? Yes. Because anyone, you could just go home right now, make a song and put it out, right? So yeah. the very entries are easy, which, which that means is there's a lot of disposable music out there. It's a lot of trash. There so is. So there's a lot of nonsense. There's a lot of noise. And you have to, it's like fighting through a middle line, right? You know, right. it's like a running back trying to get through the line. So if you get through that line, right, then 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 there's a realization, okay, I'm here. Like, okay, shit, yes. I'm making some money. I'm doing some things. Now it's like, can you stay there? Yeah, you know, because it is a disposable music. It is a short life song, a life cycle. A song has such a short life cycle. You know, kids' attention span, with it's the video game age, mm-hmm. their attention span is, you know, what was hot a week ago. Yeah. You know, is it's different the next week. So, can you either are you able are you an artist that's able to do that again and get the grass, you know, get their sure. attention, or bye bye. So, what percentage of people that you meet? That people that they they think they're talent they have some talent to the ratio of people who are really like iconic like that end up like because there's very few of those and, and every industry has 
their icons and they're the exception to the rule the majority of people come with stars in their eyes and all this stuff and and like what is that how do you know when you see first of all here's a, like when you see an artist in front of you how do you know you want to do business with this person what what do they have to bring to the table for you to go i want to invest my 400,000 or million dollars or 100,000 dollars in into this this well, act well first and foremost if me as a producer, I, I, I invest in talent, right? So okay. if, I, if I see someone who's really talented, and I'm talking like really talented, yes. just go down to Santa Monica Promenade, plop down, put a hat out, and just Have you ever seen people like it. that, met them? Yes. And got up to them and talked to them? Oh, yeah. And made them famous? Oh, uh, have I made a street? So the music? illusion, the dream happens. Like yeah. someone will find you somewhere, and, and you can be made here in this town. Well, that is, that, that, is, that is definitely true though yeah. yeah yeah i mean it is very possible um if if there's any way to do it this is the place to yeah, do it yeah. you know okay. um with that said um but i mean you know when you know all these artists have come through the voice right yep no one's really broken from the voice early on from idol people have mm -hmm. broken i'm working with a young lady now i won't say her name now until we blow her up because i don't necessarily even okay. want to connect her to idol but she came through with idol okay and um and she's a real talent by the way if you want to have any artists go ahead and name them like any up-and-comers and stuff we'll get to that later oh though. yeah let's, let's finish this topic i would just say that um if you're an iconic artist and you're really talented yep. you just got to really you know, those other factors that we were talking about earlier, like as an artist nowadays, it's different than before, right? Before you could go, you could put on a showcase or mm -hmm. something, right? And just say that, but it's now it's, it's a popularity contest. They want to know how many followers you got. They sure. want to know what you've done, how much traction you got on your own. You know, are you already are in the, are you already doing shows? Are you already on the road or does that still need to be? So that, that, that plays a lot. What about attitude? So what will you accept and what will you not accept? Because I've been in this town for a, a few years now, and there is a wide spectrum of personalities here. Well, unfortunately, they still sign whoever, but um, I, I wouldn't necessarily work sure. with. I'm, I'm right. a little particular. Like, I like to be respected just like, you know, anyone yep. else. You know, my time, you know, artists can you know, show up three hours late and all that stuff. I'm still one of the old school kind of guys. I got that from Dre. Okay. Um, Dre, would, Dre would, if you were an artist and Dre had a session with you and you came Un, like late and you didn't call and do yep. anything Dre wait for you to get there and then he'd leave that's smart yeah. by the and way. it is yeah. i just think you know we have to respect how many time. times did you see him do that oh, i've seen him do it many times <laughs> really yeah oh yeah he didn't play. and so does that cancels the session that day and then what happens well the next and, time and the then, kids on then, time yeah oh yeah oh yeah yeah and, and it's just a, you know it's a it's a mutual respect thing you know he's god like, i love that you know i've I, you and I both, Mike. I just hate people that are late. I can't even oh, stand it. When, when Mike I was a, and I when I was a single guy, I, I had I had dates with playmates. They would show up late, and I go, "Turn around, we're not going on a date." Like they didn't call. They showed up half an hour late. I yeah. don't want to start, bro. I think you took it too far. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so, so going back Maybe to the do. attitude, a lot of the yeah. kids, you know, these kids are making a lot of money. Yep. They're they're you know nineteen, twenty, twenty one, twenty two. They don't have any sense of like respect and responsibility. None. They're, they're, Nothing. They, no, they don't give a shit because so, they're okay. making they're making too much money. So what's a minimum attitude? I mean, I'm, I'm kind of really curious about this. Like, like how much of an asshole or what, like just nonsense will you put up with because you know you can make a fortune, or do you try to like send them to a psychiatrist or something? No, I mean that that's it, right? I mean that's they, it. They you put you up, have they, to make that they decision. Put up, yeah, exactly. Yeah. You, you, they put up with a lot of shit to you know. Because some of these kids are that. They, they've won that popularity contest. The, the kids have already chosen this kid. So yep. the record label really has no choice. They're like, well, this is this, this kid's making too much money for us. So <laughs> he wants a fucking pink limo. And so you want fucking green M&Ms, you're going to get green yeah, M&Ms. exactly. You oh, want okay. a fucking pink limo to sit out there at 8 a.m. even though you're not going to come out to 7.30? Really? Yeah. Because, you know, it's... it's. But they're paying for it. That's what they don't get. Yes, they are. <laughs> and, 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 it's yeah. and, and the majority of artists will tell you they don't care, you know, because really? they want what they want. Because, you know, they've worked through, they've gotten through that line of yeah. minutia. They've gotten through that sure. line of traffic. So when they've gotten through that line and they're who they are now, yep. you know, they want to come, they want to so, come to breakfast in a fur with their well, shirt, see, you know. I kind of, <laughs> like, we, we talked at the mansion about, like, the deal that, that you have for artists. Every artist should bend over backwards to do business with you. They really should. Because you actually give them everything equity and no one gives equity explain that well the difference is i want to play in a different arena because if you're if you go in the major label ecosystem then you are subject to the rules of that right right but we all know because once again going back to the intellectual property and the ownership IP, principle yeah. and the ip and owning the ip now everything you do every piece of content you put out every time so it's like oh you want to do an instagram story 
cool, do an Instagram story, but then do three or four on your own mm -hmm. thing. So yeah, do one, draw them in, mm -hmm. and then get them to you. You know what I mean? Right. And then you're monetizing, you're getting all the customer data. So you're changing the ecosystem. And and once again, what we talked about all those hands in the pocket. Right. You know what I mean? We're taking the hands out the pocket. You and putting I mean? the artist's hands in all the pockets yeah, exactly. where you never had them before. So now there's less hands, so there's more of the pot to go around. Mm -hmm. So therefore, I can be more generous with the artist, you know? Yeah. And obviously, still all the traditional stuff applies, meaning if you're a songwriter on it, you get your publishing. Sure. If you're a producer on it, you get your producer points. That's right. But now, because there's less hands in the pot on the on the label side. So the label's giving up part of their ownership. Yes. You can you can you can share with equity, you can share okay. profit, you can do things based on performance. So you can even grow, like say, even like let's say if you even started off with just only five percent or mm -hmm. something, based on certain success, you know, benchmark that goes up and up. Yeah, sure. exactly. Makes sense. Just yeah. like yeah. just any like business. any traditional right. investment. Yeah, exactly. And that and it becomes more of a almost like See, a, here's something you said. You said the word investment, and a lot of artists don't really realize the fact that you're investing in them for a return on your investment. They, they don't think that way. No, they don't. They don't get it. They get and, entitled. And, and therefore, they're not fiscally responsible because yeah. they don't get it. They don't actually think, you know, oh, you know, this, they've looked at me, they think my music is good enough to back and put it out there that people are going to listen to it enough that they're going to make their money back and then we're actually going to make money off of it because the majority of projects mm -hmm. don't, right? And then if an artist goes and wants to do something else and makes it big and he's using his artist's name, he's got to pay everybody he made that deal with, correct? That's the way, that's the yeah, way again, yeah. exactly. So um, I'm just, I just believe in, in, I believe technology has gotten us to the point where artists can participate in profit and ownership. I think that's fair. Yeah, you know, and then each deal should be tr treated that way. So meaning I don't want to participate in an artist publishing unless we do a publishing deal. Mm -hmm. And then if I do a publishing deal with you versus just the fact that you did something with my record label, I mm -hmm. took some of your publishing. Mm -hmm. No, I want to sign you right. for the record and we partner on the record. Right. Then if we do publishing, I want to partner on that. If we do touring, I want to partner on that. We do merch, we'll partner on that. You right. know, but that also means you don't have to do merch with me. You don't well, have to do touring with me. I'm well. just going to have that service available to you. It's like a full right. menu. Well, if you give them ownership, they're going to want to do more and more business with you because everywhere they go, they got that that slice of the pie they didn't have anywhere else. Yeah. I mean, for me, it's more of a, a curated approach, right? Sure. Meaning you could go- And, and this could, is important because this brings me up to, to Dre Beats. You were paramount in getting that deal done. Well, no, I named it. You named it. I named okay. it. Jimmy named is Jimmy. It. Yeah, I named okay. it. Okay. So it actually started out, um, it was a name for a sneaker. Okay. And then it, Jimmy, there's a famous speech that Jimmy always tells. He goes, him and Dre walking on the beach and he told uh, Dre, fuck sneakers, let's do speakers. And then, uh, Dre, and then Dre was like, I have the perfect name. There you go. Yeah. Okay. And so, and then with the Yeezy one, what I did with Yeezy is I introduced Kanye to the worldwide CEO of Adidas. I brought him to okay. uh, watch the throne concert. And the first meeting didn't go well, so I brought him to a second one. Oh, good. And then that's when it, and everything. And that's Why didn't so, the first meeting go well? I don't know. You know, you never know which Kanye you're going to get. <laughs> <laughs> you got the one that made meetings not go well. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that was a, that was an interesting meeting to say the least. But fortunately, I was able to get, um, uh, the gentleman's name was Herman, um, who's at the time was the worldwide CEO. He's actually passed away now, but Herman changed the culture, the corporate culture at Adidas to be able to do the Yeezy deal. And now the Yeezy, you know, Yeezy is almost a billion dollar sneaker yeah. company, you know? What yeah, because I mean? they do Y3 Yeezy. Yeah. Um, they do Rick Owens too, right? Yeah, I believe so. Yeah. I believe so. And they do Very all cool. the Pharrell stuff. But they that paved the way for that because the culture guys, the music guys weren't respected in the sneaker culture. It was all about the athletes. So, so if I was an artist, I'd be looking at the whole package and and what is offered to me, or at least what I have a potential at. So if I got a guy who can do, you know, headphones and can do sneakers and fashion, and I do real well on my label, my records and my songs, I can dovetail very easily into that. So yeah, that's I mean, to, even even if you think about it, the agencies are doing it now, right? For instance, uh, Jessica Alba had honest. She had this idea. She yeah, was new mom. She was like, "Why doesn't this exist? I want to create this." Mm -hmm. You know, her agent was like, "Well, we don't do that." Yep. So she went and figured it out. Now, you know, it's a obviously multi-billion dollar agency. Sure. So now agencies are figuring out now. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah. What about, what does the world music scene look like? Like what's happening? Where in other areas of the world uh, things are really like just blowing up and out of control yeah. and nuts? Well, I'm glad you brought that up because that's, that's what people also fail to realize in this business too. This is a global market. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? It's a, it's, 
it's I like to use this analogy. These guys in Japan told me this story. There's a, a group called Jay Soul Brothers that you probably never heard of. No. So Ed Sheeran um, sold out the O2 Arena in 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 um, London. Okay. Ninety thousand people, three nights in a row. Wow. That's two hundred seventy thousand people. Jay Soul Brothers did Tokyo Dome, which is 46,000 people, 10 nights in a row, 4.6 million people. Jesus. And also, there was they promoted the show, so there was no Live Nation or AG. They just rented out the Tokyo Dome. They got all the tickets. They do merch to, compared to us five to one. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So you see that you see what you see sure, what i'm talking about sure. so that's why i'm i'm more interested in japan in the do they call that j-pop like k-pop yeah out of yep Korea? yep j-pop k-pop and c-pop and that's china pop yep well, are there any other pops out there we should be no hey I'm that's it that's what the japan. pop is the asian hey, pop i'm trying to all find right. i'm trying to find all of them oh yeah, yeah. you right. want to sign a pop a j-pop oh i do i do tons of stuff in, in korea oh, really i already produce in korea i'm very active i go to china all the time oh, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm i'm all over that which is the, the biggest most exciting market out of those three markets I'd say the gr biggest growing one that's come out of Asia and that's global now is K-pop. K-pop. Yeah, all the all the K-pop labels have artists. What's have the number one K-pop? What's the top two or three K-pop bands that are oh, out there? Oh, BTS. BTS? Uh, BTS. Oh. B BTS. BTS. Oh, yeah. Okay. Enormous. I, I mean, they're doing huge um, you know, numbers for any U.S. artist. They're big, doing big fan of theirs, Mike? No. I don't even know who the hell they are. But and they are also. massive. Okay. Massive. Who else? Like, who's number one in China then? China, that's a good question. That I don't know. No. Um, there's a lot of China's still a, in emerging markets. Oh, yeah. So How about Japan? Um, Japan is in their number. J, J Soul Brothers are one of them. But oh, there's really? like, yeah, but there's, there's, there's like four or five okay. that are really big. Wow. Um, Japan's a massive market still because you can actually do numbers just in Japan. Mm -hmm. But everyone has to look at China. The, obviously, the hardest thing about China is getting the money out. What about the UK? What's happening there? Well, Europe is still a, it's still, uh, still a good market, and, but it's it's yeah. a smaller market, you know yeah. what I mean, in terms of... The EU, the uh, yeah. I should have said the yeah. UK, but EU. Wait, yeah. why is it hard to get your money out of China? <laughs> China, dude. <laughs> I don't know. know. I've never done business in China. <laughs> you better have a, you better have a, a, do business with a company who's got an office in Hong Kong, because if it's your money in China, it's going to stay in China. You might make a lot of money, How but much money do you have in China? Um, well, my, <laughs> so you're saying it like you have money sitting in China. Hopefully my money's sitting in Hong Kong and not China, but we'll see. We're <laughs> still, I'm still figuring that out. I'm still <laughs> we can't take an ATM card right now and access that yeah, money. But you do, you, you, yep. and I, 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 I equate it to like signing a contract in blood because you have to do a red stamp thumbprint on when you sign a contract. So to me, what? that's, to me, that's like. That's like, like um, your thumbprint. Or yeah, like you, you have to sign put a, a contract, red, but you have to put red, a red. Like that's in your blood thumbprint. Yeah. So wow. to me, that's like that's like that's, signing in blood, in my yeah, opinion. So it that, is. Yeah. yeah. But I'm still learning that market. So it is. Is so I I love them. <laughs> I don't. You know, I'm, I have nothing bad oh, to say. No, yeah. just, we're wondering how you get your money out. That's yeah, I, I, I haven't quite figured <laughs> yeah. that out yet, but I'm working on it. Nothing. Um, but it's a ma obviously you, know, you could build you a could factory go, you, and sell you, stuff to America. Yeah, <laughs> could. I mean, so you can the, go platinum in a town in China. Yeah, jeez. <laughs> the so the genius thing about what you're doing is really you're letting the artist choose. Yeah. But at the end of the day, you it's like consensual instead of like slavery in a weird way or whatever you, indentured <laughs> servitude, <laughs> however you'd say. Yeah. It. But the fact of the matter is, is they need you for all that stuff anyways, well, especially the marketing part, right? I just think, well, I mean, I think the value that you bring to the table is you help. I mean, my job, well, there's two jobs, right? My job as a music producer is to help the song be the best song it can be. My job as a record label or, or the partner in this case, my job is help the artist build a brand. That, that's which the is the things. marketing. Yeah. which is Would you say the marketing is the most important part of all of it? Well, I mean, I think you got to have a good song. So the song, the so content. I, I'd say number one thing for me, the most important thing is the song talent. Yeah, yeah, because if you if you start with some shit, you, you know, you're marketing shit. You know what I mean? It's like yeah, which and, people do, and, and you do right, and you could be clever, and you could be so good at marketing that you just sold someone some shit. Yeah, and they still, you know, we've been sold shit. Yeah, oh, yeah we all have, but that won't last. And the things that last tend to yeah, because unless they're burned. Un unless they're really good at the shit they, they do, but um, usually. The people that last have some staying power. Yeah. So I would say what I what what I what I bring to the table and, and different than what just you know, there's no right way, right? There's only a wrong way, meaning it doesn't work. So if an artist signs to a major label and that major label breaks them and they and they're successful, then they then that worked. 
you know, um, it may not be the best contract, may not be the best deal, but it still worked and they still were successful. Um, I'm just pro- providing an alternative in a, in a way that even if you have a moderate success, you can still be in business. You, you know, you don't just get dropped because, oh shit, I sold a hundred thousand records and now I'm out of a deal. And you have strong relationships. That's another thing that people uh, need to understand. Yeah. It is like the connections that you have, the network you have, and the, and the relationship you have with your network is world class. And, yeah. and and that's also what you bring to the table, yeah. that, the value of that. Yeah, and I'm just trying to change the the equation. So versus like the, the perception of, you know, you used to think, right, you, you, an artist is signed to a record label. Mm-hmm. I want to change that. Like, so meaning if I was, a, if I was an app developer, right. And a VC came along and funded me, mm-hmm. I still have ownership in my app. It's still my app. Right. You know what I mean? So that I want to change the dynamic and that's more the equation where it's like, do you see yourself artists in, in models like you owning their, their, it starts at 5%. Do you see that changing over years, getting larger and larger, depending what, what the, uh, that the artist well, brings to the table, I guess, or I think even who they are probably. Right? Yeah. And I even think that that 5% changes depending on the artist because yeah. Every, you know, like anything, it, all investments are different, right? Mm-hmm. All artists require different things. Yes, they do. One artist may not need what the other artist needs. One artist may be someone who makes, you know, music in their bedroom on their laptop. So they may only need a hundred grand to make their album. And sure. What artists would like, what do you consider? Do you take long shots on artists? And, and what would you consider a long shot rather than something that you're comfortable with? Well, I wouldn't say now, that. the reason I want that because there's a lot of guys and guys and girls out there. They think they got the talent. They think they're the shit. And everybody and, does. And, just and give me do. a chance. And right, just give me a chance. And they don't realize really how good you have to be. So what? What's the, where's where's that threshold? Where's like I'm going to take a shot at you, and this is a long shot, and here's what the deal is going to be because it's a long shot. Yeah. Versus, and we're talking about new talents that you yep. you see versus. This person is a musical genius, yeah, and and I just need to polish this up, and we're going to make a ton of money. Well, the sad part about what you just said is sometimes the long shot is that musical genius. Really, right? explain that because if you have a real talent, right? Let's say we we just found the new Whitney Houston or something, right? Okay, she requires real songs. She requires real instrumentation, real musicianship. Mm-hmm. Requires you know real studio time. And that's not one of those things where you can just, it's a, not an overnight success. Okay. That's a long. So what you're telling me is you see real talent. You're going to take longer to shape that talent and mold that talent because yeah. you understand the payoff at the end of what you yeah. have. And it takes longer to break it, right? So meaning if you have one of these kids, say like a little pump or something who comes with a really clever single, yeah, he might've just literally made with his boys in you mm-hmm. know 30 minutes mm-hmm. and he literally to make it cost them next to nothing. And, and all you have to do is put the marketing money behind it. You may break that like yeah. instantaneous, but this, this singer who's going to go out there like Adele and, you know, I mean, mm-hmm. people think Adele came out of nowhere. No, that was her second album that broke. Really? So her first album, you know, went relatively unseen. Same with Amy Winehouse. Their first, her first album went relatively unnoticed, you know? Wow. So, you know, so sometimes it is the long and, and, and hopefully someone. So you look, uh, you look like, so you'll only do a long shot if they're super, super talented. Is I just have right? to, I just have to weigh the the investment, what it takes. So okay. meaning, there's some, and I do things where I, where I what I call even like right now while I'm building my company, I do things where I call incubating. Mm. So what I just partner with the album, we you know I I I um I'll bring in musicians right, and the, their participation is basically they won't make money unless she gets a deal. So mm-hmm. the first thing we'll just put out for free or put it out, you know, relatively inexpensive. My, my key is to expose as many ears to the artist as possible mm-hmm. and then get a deal. So you, it sounds to me like you, you have the next Whitney Houston lined up. I've got, I've got a nice stable of talent. I've Do got you? some young ladies. Yeah. Great. I've got a young lady named Amalia Wadi from, um, she's from Anguilla based in New what? York. What? Yeah. I just did a photo shoot in Anguilla yep, for, for the from calendar. Anguilla. Yeah, Unbelievable. She's, Oh. Uh, one of those voices, one of those classic voices. I don't know if it's somewhere. And I don't see like fourteen thousand people living on it. Yep. And you found her down there. Wow. I found her in New York. Actually, in New York, but okay. she, she's well. amazing. I have a young lady named Moxie who was signed to Def Jam. Okay. Um, who I work with, who's really talented. Um, she was managed by Scooter Braun, who's Bieber's manager. Yep. And just the, you know, like you can have the most amazing artist, you could have the label, you could have the manager, and it still doesn't necessarily mean equate to success. So, so she just something got, else is not right. In yeah, the combination, the, you know, for whatever reason that didn't work out. So she, you know, she left the label and, and, and we're, we're rocking. She's extremely talented from, from Long Island, I believe. Uh, you know, so just, I just find these, these, a lot of times something 
people are people that just were already there mm-hmm. and then just faltered a little how, bit. How often do you run into that? Um, pretty often. Pretty really. Yeah, pretty often. So people think that they're that good. They actually just may be, or they just may be a bunch of dreamers. A little bit of both. A little bit of both. Both. But I do find a lot of really talented people, and you know, I'm only one person, so I can only take on so much. But a lot of those people sometimes they just need a little help. Mm-hmm. They just went left when they should have went right. You know. Well, when you're looking at at an artist and they write their own songs and they sing, are you looking more at their voice, at the words? What's going to carry more impact for you? Well, well, words mean a lot to me because I the think words. I think top line. Well, words and melody, okay. words and melody, and melody, melody. Yeah. Because um, top line, which they call top line, okay. right? Top line is a lost art. So that means the really okay. good songwriters are so sought after. Like for instance, one of them I just talked to in the beginning of January. I needed her to come in. Well, it's two of them. They mm-hmm. work together. I needed them to come in. She was like, "Oh yeah, Jay, we could squeeze you in February twenty eighth, like <laughs> two months later." So a really good songwriter is going to be really popular. And, and they're like poets when they write. I mean, I've looked just, at some of these words, I and mean, it's just amazing. Look at Adele, some of Adele's songs and the words. It's just like, that's deep. Did she write that herself? Mm-hmm. Yeah, she's, 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 she's a great writer. Um, so that's a lost art. So, yeah. um, But once again, now we're doing... How often do you find an artist that has that ability? It must be rare then. It is rare. Top line is a lost top art. Top line is a lost what art. artists are top line these days? We got Adele. And- Adele writes her stuff. Um, Mariah still is, has always yeah. written all her stuff. Um, some of the younger artists, some of the little bit more like sophisticated ones, like a Frank Ocean, mm-hmm. they write. Um, and then a lot of artists, they're still, you know, like Ariana Grande may co write a little bit, but okay. the, the majority of her, she worked with a, a lot of amazing songwriters. Yeah. Um, this young lady named Taylor Parks wrote quite a bit of that. So the young lady named Cadence, who's amazing. So the person who writes, what, what, what percentage of, of the thing do they get for well, if you wrote, work? It, well, if, if, if you did the music yeah. and I wrote all the, yeah. I wrote the top line of million, yeah. that 50%, so it'd be 50-50. Oh, okay. And it breaks down each way. So meaning if two people wrote the, you know, the, like say she wrote, someone wrote the chorus and I sure. wrote the verses, then we'd break. break so the best up. deal that you can be is an artist that writes their own music and, and, and can put uh, the melody to it, right? Mm-hmm. Then you're you're oh, in the driver's yeah. seat. If and you're then you can sing your yeah. perform on top of that. Wow. Yeah. For instance, Amalia, she's a hundred percent songwriter. She writes she plays oh, wow. guitar, so she okay. writes she writes her songs a hundred percent. You know. And there's quite a few that do that. You know. When you when you were coming up, who impressed you with their like work ethic and savvy? Like can you remember a time when you were just like, Wow, I gotta Yeah, oh yeah, game. yeah. Well, you know, every time you hear a good song, right, you're like, Oh shit. I got to get back in the lab. I got to get back to work. I'm not on my job. Like, so anytime you hear an amazing song, it's just like, shit, fuck, I got to get back to work. Why did I get there? Um, But I think, I think, I mean, talent is one thing, but I think there are some people that are even less talented, but they work so hard at what they do. They're they're They've had that success because they're such hard workers. Um, Like who? Ooh, there's people that just stay in the studio. Um, Bruno Mars is one of those guys just works he's just, he's a worker he's talented he's talented right but he's a studio well, how about guy. pharrell he seems like he'd be one pharrell workers. pharrell is multi-dynamic meaning yeah. pharrell's got his hands in so many and different he's busy. things he's yeah busy in a busy guy yeah, yeah. He's, he's into fashion he's into you know he's into the <laughs> he's into the um what do you call it he's got all sorts of um philanthropic projects that okay. he's into so okay. he's into yeah he's that's yeah. a busy guy right there yeah. i want to be pharrell when i grow up yeah <laughs> he's my neighbor yeah, we um. I actually met Pharrell. I went to college in Virginia, so I met Pharrell when he was eighteen. And I think I was nineteen or 20, really, yeah, something like that. Yeah, I've never so met I've him. We invited him to two of my parties. Hasn't showed up yet. But he lives in Florida a lot, so yeah, yeah, good, good dude though. Yeah, um, you're gonna have to help him to the next. Uh, oh, sure, right. yeah, sure. Fourth of July, man. Yeah. I have to find out if he smokes. Uh, Timberland was. I mean, obviously, he's made a lot of money these days. So I don't know if he's working as hard as he did back then, but Timberland was a workaholic as well. Um, so a lot of the people that you hear that have had this tremendous success, Max Martin, I mean, Max has, has a great team, but they have a really strong work ethic, you know? Yeah. Um, there's these guys called Stargate from, um, um, from Norway. They're really good as well. Um, nowadays I think a lot of kids are really work all murder beats this kid, uh, which I love. He's this, uh, this white kid from Niagara. He's kind of like, you know, this that quirky kid from Niagara. He's one of the biggest hip hop producers now okay. in the world. Yeah. You know what I mean? And same thing. He's a great example. Like when I first so, met him, when you say working hard, how many hours a week? If someone wants to bust their ass and 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 they, they got to put the time in and put and grind it out, like what are we talking? How many hours a week? Well, I mean, you can work smarter, right? Not sure work harder, but I would say these kids put in you know twelve hours a day. Some of them, 
yeah. you know, like how many days a week, six, six, seven days a week. They're yeah. just, they're workaholics because they love it, you know? Yeah. And, and that's the difference, right? You see the kids that start making money and then start going to the clubs. And then you see the kids that start making money that makes them even go in the studio. Yeah, even and more. they got more, they use the money for a studio. They reinvest they, they re, in yeah. their career yeah. and themselves. Yeah. So murder you know? beats. Um, when I first met him, he had talent, but it was his work ethic. I used to give him free studio time because I just thought the kid was that good. The, yeah. And his work ethic was there. And yeah. so if I see someone like that, you know, even if they're not the most talented, sometimes because you can, you can help guide the talent. Oh, learn this, research that, study this. Mm -hmm. And if you got the work ethic, you're going to get there. You You'll know? find something. Yeah, they're going to get there. At. Yeah, they're going to get there. How, um, Dre has a system, right? Yeah. Does Kanye have a system? Uh, completely different. Um, so what's Dre's system for hits and then what's Kanye's? I don't know. I, I think Dre's, Dre comes from sort of the perfectionist standpoint. So, I thought I knew a lot about making music before I met Dre. I'd already won a Grammy. I had already done this. I'd already done that. And when I met Dre, it, I realized, wow, I still had so much more to learn. Is it an attention to detail or what is it? Attention to detail, um, relentless, um, meaning relentless in terms of I won't, I won't rest until the song is right. The song won't come out until it's, you know, and, and that level of attention to detail I'd never seen. I would say, uh, He's a genius of that. Kanye is different. Kanye is more of, which I, which I also, I like aspects of both of how they work. Kanye is far more experimental, far more creative. Um, in Collaborative? Term, well, they both collaborate. They, so is there somebody making beats? Well, there's a team. They, there's, 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 how many are on the team? It, it, that varies, but. But just on average. When I worked with Dre, there was four to five, uh, maybe four, it, usually four of us in the room, potentially five of us all creating at once. So you're creating beats and then melodies? Music, melody, everything, yeah. And then you play it for him and he goes, No, no, no. Dre would be right there. Another guy right there. Another guy right there. I'm right here. And you're all just doing your best, all coming together. up with your best. All together. Yep, vibing off of each other. Mm -hmm. yep. And Dre's the conductor. Yep. Um, and similar way with Kanye, even though we may not all be in the same room with Kanye, it might be five studios and different producers and songwriters in different studios, but similar process. You know, but I would say just Kanye was a lot more open minded in terms of other types of music and incorporating, you know, we worked with, you know, I'd, we'd have opera singers in, we'd have, you know, also I have this amazing classical. So uh, he goes wide to pull it in kind of a thing. Yeah. Like I mean, he'll just, go down roads that aren't going to lead anywhere, but they inspire something somewhere else. No, they lead to amazing. They lead to something. Yeah. They lead to some amazing moments, you know, in every album. Every album is usually a different cast of characters. There, there's always some some of the main crew, which is which is Mike Dean, uh, Jeff Basker, and things of that nature. Plain Pat, that's like Kanye's main crew. But then there's you know Caroline Shaw, who's one of the youngest Pulitzer Prize winner, um, violinist, vocalist, um, composer. So like I mean, there's people like that. Then there's people from you know Rat a Tat Tat, who does like he was like a DJ, almost EDM guy. I mean, you have all sorts of walks of life that come in through Kanye's doors, and that is something that's amazing to me. How much attention does do you, does Dre and Kanye pay to the environment and making it special? Like, how much do they protect that bubble in order to um, protect the outcome? Well, I think they both are very. Um, their envi their personal environment is very important to themselves. So I think in terms of the people that they let in their environment or let around are, you know, they have to have good energy and good space. Uh, Dre, when I first met Dre, Dre told me he keeps a bull, you know, post death row. Dre told, told me he keeps a bullshit free environment. That was one of the first things he told me. Yeah. So he said like, don't so we would call that boundaries, right? Yes. Yeah. Don't He's got big high yeah. boundaries. Don't bring anybody in here. Yeah. Who brings bad energy or any bullshit energy. Oh, negative energy, yep. bad energy. Yep. We do a lot of shows on that. Yeah. yeah. That's important. Um, I'd say Kanye is more open minded and well, no, they both they both will meet new people and and, and embrace new people. Um Kanye might be more of a <laughs> in and out. <laughs> some people some people, you know, mm -hmm. a lot of people come through the door and a lot of people also go out the door. Yeah. He knows right away? No, no, no. He he he'll you know, some some people you know, I've there were people that I met when I first came around that are still there to this day, and there were people that were gone, you know, th three weeks later. And why are the people that were gone three weeks later gone? Was it their vibe? Was it their talent? Their, their, their vibe. 
their vibe or their or their or their ta- talent or lack thereof. And maybe they presented themselves one way, but they ended up not really. And some people just don't fit. You know, I think I like I think on any team, you know, you could have the most talented player, but if he doesn't fit in with the with the team and the system, attitude. Yeah. You know. What what leadership lessons did you learn from Dre? Well, Dre is like you said, he's the commander in chief, right? He's I think legacy also helps you get into that position, right? Meaning if Diddy's You're EF Hutton when you talk people yeah, listen. Exactly. You're if you're Dre, you know, exactly an artist is gonna, gonna listen. Like, oh, shit. Yeah, you know, not too um, many people sit in the room and think they're at that level because yeah, he's you know, got the proof. Yeah, you know, I mean I think they back it up. Jimmy, Dre, any any of those guys any of those iconic people, Rick Rubin, you know, like Rick is like, you know, the same thing, like the yoga guru. You, uh Rick will sit there cross legged on the couch and yeah. and just hold court. And he's not like, you know, Rick's not an instrument player or a he's technical a straight guy. producer. He's literally and he and he's got but one thing I, what I learned from Rick about producing is he has what I call a definitive opinion. And that you know, when you're working on a song which is subjective, a definitive opinion, whether you agree with it or not, is still important because it helps you make a decision on the direction of a song and that's that's what's really amazing about Give Rick. Give me an example of that with Rick. Well, if I if we came and presented a song, oh, I'll give you an example. There was an artist we were looking at. And Rick was like, you know, I know everybody's interested in this artist. He was like, but this artist doesn't speak to me. This artist doesn't isn't I don't feel like this artist is genuine. I feel like this artist is smoking mirrors. It's not and and he gave a very definitive opinion. I wouldn't sign this artist, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it turned out this artist ended up getting a huge deal. Like everybody was on it, so on and so forth. This artist probably hasn't sold one record or, or has it, or, you know, maybe they're yeah. still figuring out this. And we're talking three years ago, right? It was a lot of hype. I'm not going to name the artist's name and maybe they will figure it out one day, mm-hmm. but so wait, he was wait, so you, right. You, you know what's wrong with them. They don't know what's wrong with themselves. <laughs> sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes. But I mean, even be, when you run a record label, you still, you still run a business. So how much of record running a ra- record label psychology? Well, you got to, I mean, you got to be the complaint department. You got to be the therapist. You got to be everything. You got to be, I mean, dealing with an artist is. Oh, know, sure. Yeah. It's could like, be. Yeah, it, exactly. I imagine it is. You know. It's like dealing with a veteran with PSD. You know, it's all of it. It's all of the above. Yeah. Does Rick change his style for somebody like Kanye? Mm, I think Rick is Rick. I think, you know, he's always going to be, I mean, same thing. He's an iconic guy. He's always going to be Rick. I mean, he may deal with Kanye differently than he deals with, you know, I don't know, you know, whoever he's worked with, but, um. I think, I mean, you know, Rick's produced Johnny Cash. Rick has done, you know, the Red Hot Chili Peppers. I mean, so meaning yeah, iconic rap groups and all that. I think Rick is a, is a student of people as well, you know. How different is Rick's system from Dre's system? It's completely different, right? Because um, Dre plays music and Rick is a producer with an well, ear. They're, well, they're both producers with ears, you know. Yeah, I, mean? I think they're but, both. Um, don't you think that like you get a little more attached to the music if you're making the music where Rick is way back? He's 10,000 feet back. No, 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 because you know, you're still in it. Meaning you're still in it every step of the way. I need the drum beat like this. I want it to sound like that. I want it, you know, I need the bass played like this. I need this feel. That's the same thing. It was whether I played it or didn't. It, and we're talking producing now. So the difference is obviously is some producers are also musicians. So, you know, I do both. I can play bass, but I also, but I'm not a great bass player. So I would, you know, prefer to have a, an amazing bass player in, but, I, but he's going to play it how I want it played or how I feel it. You know what I mean? In, in my, in my composition. So I, I saw it, meaning I feel just as connected to it if I told the bass player how to play it or if I played it. The thing that I, that I've read about Rick is like the artists that go through there, they're all doing transcendental meditation. Like he definitely has a system that he he's he doesn't he doesn't dictate it he just no but he inspires it, it. Yeah, inspires it because people want to be like rick right yeah. so there's a big there's a word i love and, and and with my company this is a big part of what i'm doing in terms of the dna of my company the the word is exposure and so i feel like it is going back to speaking on mm-hmm. if i'm talking to my 24 year old self yes um i would it's that exposure so i would expose um artists to you know to all these things because you know the things that work for me, and I'm not saying that you got to do it, but I'm going to expose you to it. I'm going to tell you about it. Give it a try. try. Yeah, you know, I'm going to try to. And because there's so many things of that nature that I, so I, I always do that with artists. That's that's part of my whole thing is exposure. 
There, yeah. There's one aspect of songwriting I, I, I'm, I'm curious about. It's it's the hooks in, in the music. Do most artists write their own hooks or other guys write the hooks? I, I've heard that there's a catalog of hooks that you can buy or, and stuff like, like a hook book. I, I don't know. Because it's a secret catalog? <laughs> Not a secret catalog, but there's guys who just, all they do is make hooks and they sell these hooks for oh, like lots and lots of money. Right? Well, songwriters, but I mean, yeah. um, there's no book, I don't think, out there of hooks. Um, really? Yeah, if there, if if there shit, is, you want it. Shit, yeah, yeah, you know, right. get yeah. it for you. <laughs> yeah. So usually the writer writes the hook. There's yeah, and, artist, and artists write hooks. hooks. Okay. Yeah, and artists do. Okay. I mean, you you know, you've, obviously some writers are better than others, and other you know, mm-hmm. but but you know, I once again, I love talented writers. I think okay. it's a lost art. Um, we're in the world of what I call swaggy too. So meaning, there's some art writers now that are just swaggy. Yeah, <laughs> it's more about the sauce than the actual talent. But yeah. even but nowadays, you know, sometimes sauce wins too. So. If I write a song, do I get upfront money plus a percentage? How does that work? Because I know when people write a great sales letter, copywriters no, do. No, not yeah. writers. No. Writers, the only way you get upfront money is if you go do a publishing deal. Okay. Writers, unless you're one of the top tier writers, ah. can you get a writing fee? Okay. But writers get publishing now, okay. which is lucrative because the, sure. the more copyrights, you, you know, the more stuff you own, the bigger your catalog, the more valuable your catalog. And what catalog. does that percentage usually run? Should it? I mean, if you... If you write the song, you get half the money? Well... Um, in terms of you get half the money of the publishing that it generates. Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. You know what I mean? Um, so, but I mean, catalogs are, I mean, enormous. I mean, I, I think all these questions, I don't know anything about the yeah, music Yeah. I think business. dream who's one of the yeah. top songwriters just sold yeah. a portion of his catalog or quite a bit of his catalog. I mean, I think it was 28 million. So it's, it can be, wow. Yeah. You know, if you're a big too. songwriter. Yeah, didn't yeah. Bernie Taupin and Elton John sell, they sold theirs for 10 years for like a hundred million or something. Yeah, something crazy. crazy. Yeah. Something Nuts, crazy. right? Yeah. David Bowie did that deal, some insane deal before, you know, he did some. Pays, uh, to, pays to write your own songs, Mike. So I suggest well, you start listen. writing your own oh, songs. Oh, listen, I could write some deep songs. I, like, I'm good at writing. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 the part of my curiosity is well, I think I can write some songs. Mike's great at writing sales copy. <laughs> we wrote this sales letter the other day, like last Friday. Oh, Mike comes up with some stuff. It's, cra- it's crazy. So okay. the yeah, premise of this show is... Mike and I were in his backyard at the mansion and we were talking about, man, it would be so cool if we could go back and talk to our 24-year-old self oh, and, and have these conversations that we're, that we're having now. So if you went back in time and you're sitting there across from the 24-year-old self and you got 10 minutes with the 24-year-old you, what, what would you say? The first thing I would say is don't get in that car. <laughs> There's a, there's a car that I should have got in. Right. Um, that's the first thing. But right. maybe that's a life lesson. So anyway, okay. maybe, I don't know. I don't know. If maybe life would have been different right. if I hadn't got the car. But that would probably be one of the first things yeah. I would have said. Um, second, I would have said, um, well, the one thing that I believe in, and you know, and this is for any new songwriter or new producer, I think they should learn instruments and master instrumentation. Obviously, computers nowadays allow you to cheat. Allow you so to do like things. music theory you're talking about. Learn or? music theory, but actually, like really study, like yeah. learn, like really learn chords and learn, how learn how to play. Piano. Piano. What's one of the best music schools in, in the nation? Ber- like, Berkeley. Berkeley. Yeah, Berkeley. Berkeley School of Music in Boston. Ber- really? Yeah. Okay. Which I'm from Boston, which I probably should have went to Berkeley, but you know, okay, you know, interesting. We all, would it would it be the piano or what would you say? The, to if, learn? if I had to say one instrument, the piano, because that's yeah. the foundation of everything. And obviously, nowadays you have keyboards that simulate other sounds. Mm-hmm. So if you know how to play piano, you can play anything because you play you know, on a keyboard oh, that's right, or, yeah. and synthesizer. So actually, learn how to play the piano. Learn music. Actually, learn how to play music. Learn theory. Really understand it because that that's how you. We talk about staying power and mm-hmm. longevity and things of that nature. I mean, that's why there's so many amazing songwriters from Sweden and, and Scandinavia. And yeah, why is that? Because it's six months of darkness. Ah, so you fucking, of yeah, yeah. If you're, you're fucking sitting in the dark. You're gonna sit there and play a guitar all year too and be depressed. <laughs> why don't good artists from Alaska? That was come my next dude. question. Was gonna <laughs> be that was my next question. I was what talking to my little brother in Alaska. Yeah. There's like oh, yeah. four hours of sunlight a day or something. Yeah. I'm like, well, it's a choice to live there, bro. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They, there's flights every day. Get the fuck out. I mean, I've met people in, in where was I was at, Norway. I mean, the guy was a fucking God-level musician, right? I mean, yep. he's giving me Motown harmonies. This is like this guy. And he's an air traffic controller. <laughs> like, he's not even wow. a he He's not even in the music business. For the, yeah, a living. It's like it's a little a side hobby. hobby. Yeah. I'm like... Are you kidding me? Like you, it, I was like, if you oh, moved listen. to the U.S., you would be Max Martin. I'm with I'm with some <laughs> surgeon guy in Germany, and whatever, I had some stuff done, and he uh, we're eating dinner, 
and and then he goes, oh, I got to leave at such such a time. I got to go play the piano at 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 a, at a place with my my group. And I'm going, wait a minute, you play and your instruments and you have this little group. He goes, oh yeah, a jazz group. I've been doing this for like, you know, fifteen twenty years. And yeah, that's his like hobby yeah. side gig. Gives him pleasure. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's probably. Good but you never know. Yeah, so I mean, you know, that, what else to the twenty four year old self? Um, discipline. You know what I mean? Ooh, I think, that's a big one. I think uh, I always, I think I always had a good work ethic. I think I, you know, my grandfather was a hardworking guy, and I think he instilled a good work ethic in me. So I think that was one of the things that I was really good at. Work ethic is obviously important, so I had that. I think what what you need um, is discipline. You know, I mean, because it is the entertainment business. It is, you know, okay. there's a lot of things that can pull you off your path and focus. Sure. So focus and discipline would have been one of the things I would have really uh, stressed. Do you warn family. artists coming into this environment, like what's going to come at them and to be prepared? I do. Good. And and, and, yeah. and some want that and they welcome it. So some, Sure. In some, the beginning, sure, because it's new and it's exciting. Yeah. yeah some then are, you realize what it is. Well, and, some are even, yeah. that's what they're there for. Okay. And then you find out the other ones who are there for, for, for yeah, well, yeah for, because you know, for the right reasons. Yeah. So um, other than that, um, I would have probably started traveling the world sooner. That's to important. pick up other cultures. That's important. Just exposure. Yeah. Once again, back to that word exposure. Um, Get into K-pop sooner. Yeah, all of it. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. C-pop. Exactly. C-pop. Is that uh, your favorite, Mike? C-pop? I have no idea. I can actually like K-pop. I'll, I'll send you some I, good some, K-pop. Yeah, I would. I actually like K-pop. Some of the, the songs. Uh, who is that one guy? He's so like like. Uh, Are you talking about the uh, with the one uh, bird? What, well, what the hell is that? The name. Oh yeah, Ganya yeah, or whatever it was. Yeah. He was uh, he. Gond- Gond- Gondam style? Yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Wasn't yeah. that like a whole dance and everything? Mm-hmm. Like a dance craze. He monetized that thing. Yeah, he did. I don't know. Hopefully he made some money on that. Oh, sure. I'm sure, I'm sure he made, yeah. I'm sure he's set for life off of that. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, I hope anyway. Or somebody yeah. is set somebody for life. Set for somebody life. Yeah. So uh, tr- travel sooner. Travel sooner because yeah. of what I think what, what uh, travel did is expose me to not only more music, but more culture. And more culture also helps you create more art. You know what I mean? So that literally filled my tank with creativity, just traveling, you know? And I think, and for, especially coming from the U S we're so, you know, we're so used to this, this society in this country that just seeing for better or for worse, you know what I mean? I mean, you go someplace, you've seen like extreme poverty, you're like, Oh shit. But like, you still learn something. But you from still that. learn something yeah. about it and realize you get out of your cushy bubble here, you know? That's right. And, and you, you go someplace. How lucky we are. Yeah. You know, and yeah. other things. And have some know. gratitude. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and appreciate really. it. and and both and then other times you see some shit the extreme wealth and you're like oh my god like yeah. that's, that's crazy you know what I mean? like when you're fucking yeah. seeing sheiks and shit like that you know yeah you know, hanging around in you know a380s what's the big <laughs> what's the next big disruption in the music industry oh yeah this you what, I, what i'm talking about well not even me i mean what you, what's the name I, I, feel, I feel like sharing it like uh the uh we, we're, we're in the trademark search but workshop hopefully workshop, workshop with Nova. that's great oh. yeah workshop with Nova. exactly we go to work we go to yeah. work. We, we 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 get our hard hat and our, you know and, yeah, and our lunch feels pail. Collaborative too. We go to work. Yeah, you know it's, it's about putting the work in. Um, but um, we're just trademark search, so we're dealing with all that shit. But so maybe workshop music, workshop Detroit. But um, it's it's so we'll see. It's going good so far. Um, anything else? I'm trying to think. Anything else? Safe. Big disruption. <laughs> Safe. Oh, disruption. Well, I think I think just you know transparency. I think that's coming. Um, and I think, you know, it's going to get to a point where artists demand it and that's going to, is AI going to help with that? Yeah. And also help target where the music's going to go and who the next you know, potential. Yeah. I think, I, I think at any, I think at any given time you should be able to go in, look on an app or whatever and be able to look at exactly what's going on with your life and your yeah. career and your business, you know, like any other business. They hold some of that shit back though until you get certain oh. benchmarks. Huh? Uh, well, yeah. yeah. You can only, you know, most record companies, you can only audit twice a year. Really? Yeah, you know hey, hey, what? What you want to open the books? <laughs> <You know? laughs> no, not yet. Yeah. Oh, wait, there was a couple. I don't know if you ever seen that Five Heartbeat movie with Big Red. Yeah. <laughs> My office hours are from nine to five. <laughs> Do we have um, anybody in the audience who yeah. want to ask a question? You got one? How is it to? I never written a song with other people because usually you get like at least for me like I hear it in my mind. You have an inspiration. You have to be alone to get it. Mm-hmm. Get the whole song through. Yeah. If anybody distracts you, you're like, please don't talk to me. How is it like? You said you would work like with three or four other people and writing a song all together. How does that work? Like, I have this idea. Can you keep on going? Do you um, like it? I don't like great, it. Great question. Well, yeah. <laughs> it is. A very collaboratory effort. You know what I mean? Um, 
there's one of the things that's really popular these days is writing camps. So Ooh, with which, writing, camps. writing camp, which is like, let's say they're working on an album for, or, you know, Beyonce or something. And they'll put together a writing camp with different writers and producers and so forth. Usually team, like somebody that's really good at melody, somebody who's really good at lyrics. And then obviously somebody that's good at a track or whatever. Um, so it's very collaborative. And I mean, you could have even two or three writers in a room. And, and I just say it's very collaborative. Someone might, someone might come up with an amazing melody. I mean, I was just in uh, a camp in Bangkok in November and in one instance I was waiting for dinner and I, I wrote a chorus, right? So I'm just, and I'm not really a top line. I'm really more of a producer song, like music guy. Um, and I wrote a chorus and then, so when I came in the next day, I had this chorus idea. I gave them the chorus idea and this, the, the guy who was more of this, the melody guy, as soon as he heard my chorus, he had the two verses like that. And next wow. thing you know, we have two verses and a chorus, and then all we needed was the bridge. But anything good comes from metal Teamwork. on metal, right? Oh. Yeah, tension. There's got to be some friction, or it wouldn't Tension's work. Good. Nothing yeah, can true. be easy. Oh. oh yeah, and there could be drama. That, no. There could be drama. Yeah, I mean, there could sure. be. Don't get me wrong. There could be. You know, someone you gets throw stuff. Someone doesn't. I don't, I never do. I'm Zen. I'm the. I'm like <laughs> Phil Jackson, but. I've seen people storm out of rooms. I've seen people throw stuff. Not necessarily at somebody, but throw stuff nonetheless. Did you read Eleven Rings? No. His book? Uh uh. It's great. You'd love it. I'll have to check it out. Thank you. Good question. Thank Thank you. you. Anybody else have a question? Being a part of the beehive, I have a Beyonce question, of course. Um, what is it that Beyonce and Jay Z is doing together that makes them so powerful? Because you notice now a lot of artists are trying to be with other artists so that they can like take over the world or whatnot. <laughs> um, so what is it that they're doing that's keeping them, you know, so excellent? Well, don't you think that's like what businesses do too, right? Right? They merge, like exactly. companies merge and and get bigger, and that's what they did. Um, they, I, I don't, I, you know, I don't, I think they genuinely liked each other. You know what I mean? I'd like to of believe course. that they genuinely. <laughs> um, but it's still the merging of two big brands. You know what I mean? And that just makes a bigger brand. You know, so like when Apple bought Beats, yeah, and and Beats Beats is a baby. Apple just did that purely for marketing. Like they don't give a shit if Beats makes money or not. I mean, wow. in the in the grand scheme of things, you know, Beats is a baby compared to Apple. Yeah. So does because you know they're one of the first people to throw out an album secretly. Beyonce, I, I can't think of anyone who's done that. Well, before. other smaller independent artists have done it, you know, but obviously they don't make the same splash as a Beyonce doing it. So she was the first one at that level to do it. And that's why it was so, you know, so big and such a big story. Um, but other artists have done it that are just smaller, just, you know, just no one knows them. But I think any creative marketing thing I love because why not? You know, meaning when Kanye wanted to project against building, you know, at first people were like, what the fuck are you talking about? You know, but I thought I thought it was genius because it was like he was like, oh, that you know, people will come with their cell phones and they'll 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 tape it with their cell phone and then they'll post it and we get all this resi-, you know, like he comes with those kind of things. I thought it was genius. You know, obviously he's but, thinking a couple of moves ahead. Yeah, but yeah. other people were like, wait, you're gonna drive trucks around the city and project against a wall? Mm-hmm. Like what the fuck? You know. So I love creative marketing ideas. Yeah. You know. Has there been any artists that you've worked with that you've been impressed with that has really remained unchanged and stayed true to who they are despite gaining immense popularity or fame? Two chains. He's just a really genuine person, meaning if you call, he calls back. You know what I mean? If he doesn't pick, you know, artists become artists, right? Meaning they don't, they're hard to reach. They don't, you know, you've helped, you know, when they wanted something, they, you know, you're, you, they expect you at their, you know, beck and call, and then you can't reach him for weeks and shit like that. So, I I appreciate the people that once they because you helped them along the way and they still they reciprocate, you know, Um, I would say two chains is like that. Ty Dollar is like that. But I could I could go down the list. There's there's a lot of really good like, you know, people in this in this industry. Um, There are also a lot of assholes, which I won't name. (laughs) But there are no, also on, let's go through the list. A lot of number really, one. <laughs> oh man, that's a long. That might be a longer that's list. A that's a longer the number list. one. That's the number one list. is a long list. Yeah, so, that's a know, longer list. A lot of a lot of contenders there. Um, Gwen Stefani's like that. Um, Christine Aguilera is like that. You know, she's like one of my favorite people in the world. Um, who else? Uh, there's just a lot of really genuine people. Mary J. Blige is very genuine. Um, Diddy, who you would imagine it would be so Diddy. He's actually exactly how he was, you know, (laughs) Diddy's the first person to bring me to Los Angeles in 92. And he, he is exactly how he was then. Like, you know what I mean? Still like, you know, the life of the party, so to speak. 
So uh, you said that the number one most important thing is the song. So um, what is the best song ever written? Ooh. <laughs> Put him on the spot. I mean, that's subjective. I'm a huge Beatles fan, but um, um, there's this song written by Curtis Mayfield called The Makings of You. That's probably one of my all-time favorites. Um, it's just special. I think it's just, I mean, he just says some things in it that I'm like, he says like, some deep stuff. Yeah, honeysuckle. Like, it's just amazing, the lyrics. So that's probably one of my all-time favorites, Sitting on the Dock of the Bay and, and oh, yeah. Try a Little Tenderness by Otis Redding are some of my all-time favorites, Living on a, a Prayer by Aretha Franklin, um, uh, the uh, the, J, the one James Harrison wrote, The Wind Cries. It's one of my All Along the Watchtower, which was written by Bob Dylan, but I love the Jimi Hendrix version. Um, I mean, I could go on for days. Great, great job. This was a fun show. Oh, this was great. This is good. Show. So, I, so I was a little bit more personable than Dame Dash. Oh, <laughs> my God. a lot more. And you actually gave value to our listeners instead I, of attitude, which I, is I, nice. I, Thank I hope, you. I appreciate it. I hope, I hope I expose somebody to something. Sir, <laughs> jo Sir Joey. Yes. Oh, hold on. We got a question over here? I just got a quick question. Uh, so realistically, labels, um, what value do they bring right now to an artist? And second part to that is, do labels as a whole in the industry have a, a short a shelf life in the near future? Well, um, the labels still own quite a few copyrights, right? And so a lot of the biggest earner, earning thing in, in streaming is, is catalog. So they're still making a ton of money. So that's what's extending the shelf life, right? Meaning they're sitting there. I think 70% of all streaming is, is catalog. They're still valuable because they have money, right? So they have money that can... An artist, and, and once again, an artist usually does not have money. So someone with money is always going to be attractive and they, and they shell it out. They'll, they'll, you know, some artists, you know, whether you're a new artist and they give you, you know, they do a deal for you for a hundred grand and put 25,000 in your pocket. That's still more money than you had yesterday. Or you're an artist who's got some level of traction and they're giving you three million, you know, a deal, you know, and maybe takes 400,000 to make your album and two million goes to your pocket, et cetera, et cetera. So, they have that value and they still, you know, in theory, they still market and promote your project. I'd say one of the biggest values that record labels still have is their relationship with radio because the, the radio is still the number one, even with all this stuff going on in the internet and social media, terrestrial radio is still as dinosaur as it is an archaic a system as it is. It is still one of the biggest ways of discovering music in the world still. Really? Yeah. And Clear Channel is like a company that has like, I don't know, some retarded number of in debt. You know what I mean? So it's like, would I want to start a record company? Hell no. I mean, a radio station? Hell no. But it's still one of the biggest discovery platforms ever. So the barrier of entry to promote a song on radio is still expensive. So, you, you, which means it's harder for an independent artist to do, to do. So therefore, you know, a record label still has some value there. We got to give a plug to our girl Brittany at Rick Owens, too. Yeah. Shout out to Brittany at Rick Owens. He's wearing the Rick Owens boots. I almost wore mine, too. I'm, now I'm mad that I, I just ordered mine. a size 13. I, I saw Chris's and I, and I ordered the exact same pair. I'm headed there after this because yeah. she has some jeans yeah. for me. So She's any, the greatest. So, any of you high fashion buffs that don't just follow the trends, Rick Owens. Yeah. You would, yeah. But most people can't catch up well, to that. Well, this was a great show. I know our listeners. Got a lot of great information, yeah. and it exposed the the industry for for like how it really works. And yeah. I think that's important because that's what the show's about: is telling people how things really work, not what you think, not what you're you're sold, yeah. you know, through the the box as I call it, the yeah. TV set, but how it really works. And yeah. You did that today, thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. you so thank, much. Thank you so much for Good having job. me. Thank yeah, you for the hos tough. thank you for the hospitality. Thank you for the tequila. Yeah. Thank you for the Creative Kingdom. Yeah. There That's you your go. favorite one? Creative that is my Kingdom? favorite one. Mine too. That's your favorite of your blends is Creative Kingdom? Oh, yeah. I smoke that the most. Absolutely. Nice. Yeah. I, I kind of made it for me, to be honest with you. <laughs>